Hey guys, and welcome to this movie reading of Us by Jordan Peele. If you're into filmmaking, this was one of the best screenplays of 2019 in its category, maybe of all. Jordan Peele is a great writer and director, and if you haven't seen the movie, I highly recommend it, as well as listening to this whole screenplay. If you like this script, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, as it helps me know what kind of movies to make readings for in the future. One last thing. If you aren't subscribed to the channel, hit the red button to be notified when more movie readings come online. Without further ado, Us by Jordan Peele. There are thousands of miles of tunnels beneath the continental United States, abandoned subway systems, unused service routes, and deserted mine shafts. Many have no known purpose at all. A VHS static crackle gives way to a fast-paced, energetic and dated 80s television promo. Go to YouTube, search Hands Across America MTV, and you will see the following. Stock footage. A magenta collage of different sized blinking human eyes. Imagine, over 300 smiling teeth in a row. A collection of different sized smiles fill the frame. An aerial view of the Statue of Liberty. In a line that stretches from the Statue of Liberty, a foggy view of the Golden Gate Bridge, all the way to the Pacific Ocean, a large crowd of people. An iconic red, white, and blue rendering of the North American continent. The words, Hands Across America, lie across it. Hands Across America, a 4,000 mile long chain of good people. A green animated line moves left to right in a jagged route across the country. A wave crashes against a craggy rock. From sea to shining sea. An aerial view of Manhattan at sunset. The Empire State Building and the Twin Towers stand tall over the skyline. A San Francisco streetcar packed with gleeful tourists climbs uphill. A man reads a newspaper with a two-paged spread promotion for the charity supergroup Band-Aid. A behind-the-scenes view of the USA for Africa recording session for We Are the World. An aerial view of a sea of writhing fans packed into an outdoor benefit concert with gigantic banners that read Live Aid. A close-up of another outdoor benefit concert banner that reads Farm Aid along with the slogan, Keep America Growing. A close-up of a sullen 1980s rocker in aviator shades, bandana, and tank top. An undulating mass of shirtless, sweaty concertgoers. A large, white graphic soars over the crowd and lands lower center. It reads, May 25th, 1986. On May 25th, six million people, including some of the world's biggest rock and roll icons, will join hand in hand. A static black and white image of a destitute bearded man slumped over in a stoop. To fight hunger in the United States. Two hands emerge from either side of the screen. An image of an American heartland. They grip each other in the center of the screen. Two hands emerge from either side of the screen over an image of the snow-capped Rockies. They grip each other in the center of the screen. And MTV can help put you there. Two men grip hands across the center of the screen overlaid on a stock image of a city seaport and the Hands Across America logo. Call toll-free 1-800-USA-9000. Learn more about Hands Across America. A buffalo standing in tall grass shakes its head violently. A large American flag waves in the breeze behind a gigantic telephone pole and its matrix of taut wires. A man and woman hold hands overlaid on low POV footage of marathon runners. A man and woman hold hands overlaid on a static view of the Hollywood sign. Two men grasping hands overlaid on footage from a red tractor trailer exiting an interstate off-ramp. From the center of the hands, the red MTV logo appears. It rotates until it reveals that the T and V 
our arms and hands gripping each other. And watch for further developments on MTV. The screen goes black. It's 1986. A colorful, vibrant energy. Pedestrians walk along the boardwalk, past game booths and souvenir stands, as a roller coaster screams by overhead. Adelaide, 9, African American, wears a Hands Across America t shirt and her hair up in pigtails. She holds a candied apple and watches her father Russell, 33, African American, hurl a baseball and topples a pyramid of bottles at a bottle pyramid booth. He's clearly in a bad mood and takes it out on the bottles. Rain, Adelaide's mother, 30, African American, claps obligatorily. The booth attendant, Danny, a stoner, feigns excitement. Judging by their physical energies, Rain and Russell had a huge fight earlier. Russell picks up a beer. Great shot. You put some heat on that. Thanks. I guess I missed my chance to go pro. You can get a prize from the second level or keep going for a prize from the third level. What do you think, Addy? Should we stop or keep going? Adelaide looks at Rain. Don't look at me. It's your birthday. Adelaide points to a t-shirt. I want that one. Yeah, all right, that one. Russell takes the shirt, then takes Adelaide's candied apple and hands it to Rain. Here. Moments later, Adelaide lags behind Rain and Russell as they stroll down the strip. She wears a new oversized Michael Jackson's Thriller t-shirt. Rain says to Russell, That t-shirt better not give her nightmares. In trouble for buying my daughter a shirt. That's a new one. She got scared when it was on TV. You'd know that if you were around. Who let her watch it? I wasn't scared. You hid your eyes when the people came out the ground. No. Russell to Rain. I need another beer. Adelaide turns her head and sees a drunk sailor, Ted, spill his drink on his white uniform. Mm-hmm. I can't have a beer now. You can do whatever you want. Okay, then. The roller coaster rumbles by again. Adelaide watches it. The screams startle her a little. What about the dipper? Hey, Addie, you want to try it? You know she's not big enough, and I'm sure as hell not going on that thing. They pass a table where two teenagers, Mandy and Downey, eat fast food like pigs. Moments later... Adelaide, Rain, and Russell arrive at the Whack-A-Mole booth. Whack-A-Mole, this is my game. To the booth attendant, Troy. How many tickets? Four? Yeah. Russell slams four tickets down, grabs the tethered mallet, and starts playing. Addie, come to the bathroom. I don't have to go. Russ, will you watch your daughter, please? I'm watching. He's not. He's playing whack-a-mole. Rain heads off. Adelaide watches Russell for a moment before her attention turns to the ocean. She walks towards the edge of the boardwalk. A young homeless man, young Ferdy, lurks by a wooden staircase leading to the beach. He's clutching a cardboard sign with a Bible verse scrawled across it. Jeremiah 11.11 is boldly written, and young Adelaide stares at the numbers as she passes him. He looks right at her. Two teens, Glenn and Nancy, flirtatiously play rock-paper-scissors. They keep landing on the same combination over and over. Oh my god. That's impossible! They do it again. They land on scissors. What the hell? How are you doing that? I'm not doing anything. You are. Adelaide walks down the stairs and onto the beach, where a few teenagers act wild by a small campfire. Adelaide passes by the teenagers as she walks towards the water's edge. Moments later, she approaches the shoreline and scans the dark horizon. In the distance, a large cloud erupts in silent lightning. After a breath, she turns back toward the boardwalk. One attraction faces her on the beach level underneath the boardwalk. It's called Shaman's Vision Quest, a Native American mystical-themed funhouse with an entrance that faces the water. 
The facade is painted to resemble a forest with colorful images of spirit animals and a large shaman who glares, pointing his fingers directly at Adelaide. Signs near the arched doorway read, Get Lost, and Find Yourself. Adelaide walks towards the Vision Quest portal. She drops the candied apple which falls into the sand. As Adelaide gets near the entrance, a thup or two of thick raindrops hit the sand. The crowd over at the boardwalk murmur. Adelaide enters just as the rain hits full on. Adelaide enters the Vision Quest and goes down a hallway, made to feel like a magical walk through a dark forest. The walls are dressed and painted like woods, with the occasional eerily pleasant deer, rabbits, and eagles. A cacophonous recording of nature sounds plays over hidden speakers. A cast plastic owl on a branch pounces out from a dark crevice, startling Adelaide with a hoo-hoo. The owl emits a hiss of pressurized air and returns to its starting point. Adelaide calms herself and continues into the maze. Adelaide enters a room that's still forest-themed, but also covered in mirrors. She walks past several distorted reflections, a short one, a weird one, and a weirder one. With a rumble of lightning, the lights go out. The forest noise stops. What was kind of eerie when lit becomes downright terrifying when dark. The only light comes from the glowing red exit sign. She walks towards it, but hits a mirror. She looks up. The exit sign appears forwards and backwards, over and over again, in the infinite reflections. Adelaide reaches her hands out and tries to make her way down the mirrored wall. She begins whistling, Itsy Bitsy Spider, again to make her feel at ease. But she stops in near panic when a whistle from the halls overtakes her. Somebody, somewhere in the mirrored labyrinth, is whistling in an attempt to emulate her tune. Something her size scurries quickly across the hallway. Adelaide backs up almost against a mirror. She slowly begins to turn 180 degrees to face the mirror behind her, but her reflection doesn't turn. This isn't a mirror, it's the back of another identical girl's head. Black. Close up on a red, wet rabbit's eye. Us. Music. A children's choir hums a dark anthem in a strange language. The song is melodic and bright. Hopeful, but also unfamiliar and wrong. We slowly pull away. The rabbit sits on a brass cage against a tiled wall. We pull out to reveal more and more rabbits in cages stacked one on top of the other. We look out the rear window of a car past stick figure stickers depicting father, mother, daughter, and son. The Wilson's car travels through a rural road where woods and beach meet. The Wilson's car arrives. Adelaide Wilson, African American, now 34, wakes up in the passenger seat. She looks over at Gabe Wilson, African American, 34, a large man with glasses who thinks he's a bit cooler than he is in the driver's seat. Gabe holds his finger in front of his mouth like, shh. Adelaide knows where this is going. They look at the kids asleep on the back. Zora Wilson, African-American, 13, and Jason Wilson, African-American, 11. Gabe yelling, We made it! The kids wake up in a panic. Gabe laughs. Why? No. Because y'all sleep too much. We're in the Wilson's Bayside House driveway. The Wilsons emerge. Adelaide looks down the road ponderously. Jason starts wandering off. Jason goes to the back of the car to get his bag. Zora checks her phone. Wi-Fi isn't working. You don't need the internet. Out here you've got the outer net. Good one. Hey, little man, bag's inside first. Jason runs back and Gabe hands him his bag. Can we rewind her? I don't think they work like that. Just one year. She laughs. Gabe kisses her neck real quick and goes inside. We pass through the Wilson's foyer. Hanging on the wall are pictures of Adelaide at different stages of life with Russell and Rain. There's one of her at 14 in ballet class. 
There's also pictures of Zora and Jason with their grandmother. What do you call a cow with no legs? <laughs> ground beef. Ha <laughs> ha. Get it? Because he's on the ground? We get it. You should practice while you're here. Ugh. Okay. What? What? Why you got an attitude? Oh, I'm sorry. Yay, track and field. We find the Wilsons eating fast food in the breakfast nook. Zora and Gabe power through their food. Jason sits quietly, occasionally snapping his right hand. He wears a plastic werewolf mask on his head. Adelaide eats strawberries out of a Tupperware container. She plays with her food a little. Whoa, really? You're overrunning now? You love track and field. What's the point? The Olympics? I'm not going to make it into the Olympics. You can do anything you set your mind to. Can I drive while we're up here? Adelaide and Gabe. No. That's what I set my mind to. I set my mind to driving. Change your mind. Why not? Jason runs off to his room. Because we said so. Jason, finish your food, please. Kara and Haley drove with parent supervision. You don't need to drive when you're an Olympic caliber athlete. You run. My god. You should run on the sand. Why? Because it's harder, no traction. You practice on the beach. When you get on solid ground, you'll take off. Adelaide is caught off guard by the mention of the beach. We're going to the beach? Yeah. Later. I thought we'd go when we're settled. Cool. What beach? Santa Cruz, the boardwalk. I told you about this. No, you didn't. Josh and Kitty and the girls will be there. Adelaide and Zora share an eye roll. Do we have to sell Grandma's house? Gabe looks to Adelaide before he answers. Well, it's not that we have to. We have to because school is too expensive and coming here once a year doesn't make it worth it. Another awkward silence. Jason's constant snapping lingers. What are you doing? It's a magic trick. I left it here last year. Okay, let's see it. Everyone looks expectantly. Jason snaps again. Nothing happens. They look at each other. This thing is bullshit. Whoa, excuse me? Gabe points at Jason. You cursing at the table now? Jason mumbles to Gabe. When you point a finger at someone else, you have three pointing back at you. What the hell is that supposed to mean? I think it means you curse at the table too. Gabe grumbles and goes back to eating. Well, it's four fingers anyway. Four fingers pointing back at you. One's a thumb, and that's not pointing at you. Go to your room. Gabe looks at his hand for a second, then brushes it off. A young Adelaide sits in a psychiatrist's office, intense and still on a sofa. Through a sliver of open door, we can see Russell and Rain speaking with Dr. Foster. I think she has post-traumatic stress disorder. What? She wasn't in Nam. She got lost for 15 minutes. That can be very scary. We don't know what happened to her. So, how do we get her to talk? I could meet with her once a week. Uh-huh. For how long? I think we need to encourage her to draw, write, dance. Anything to help her tell us her story, but we have to be patient. Rain quietly weeps. Dr. Foster passes her a tissue. Russell goes to touch Rain, but she pulls away. I'm going to have a smoke. Russell leaves. In present day, Adelaide lays on a couch looking at one of Jason's rubber spider toys. A real spider climbs across it. Gabe unpacks with a pep in his step in a nearby room. Gabe, on the phone. Yeah, we'll see. Well, that's a coincidence. Listen, hey, listen. I'm not going to say anything, but wait for it. You'll see. Okay, you'll see. Gabe finishes his call as Adelaide looks at the spider. Gabe on the phone. Why would I lie? All right, see you soon. He hangs up. That was Josh. We'll leave in an hour. We just got here. They stayed an extra day so we can meet up. He sees her reaction. 
What, you don't like Josh and Kitty now? Uh, damn, it's like that? Okay, name one thing with Josh and Kit. They drink too much. Okay, two things. Gabe. Zora and the girls get along? No. What's the point of the summer home by the beach if you never go to the beach? There's a beach just down that hill. That's not a beach, it's a shore. That's a bay. I'm talking about the real beach. Sand, an amusement park, people. There are weirdos at that beach. Gabe realizes there's something deeper going on. Okay. Okay, I'll cancel. It just sucks. I know Jason was looking forward to it. First time back after Grandma died. I think being here is hitting him hard. Adelaide begrudgingly. We leave there before it gets dark. Yeah, <laughs> hell yeah, it's gonna be fun. He goes for a kiss. She laughs and playfully pushes him away. You don't have to kiss me. You're in trouble for later, though. He heads to the door. She can tell he's up to something. Oh, you think so? Oh, yes. Where are you going? Taking out the trash. I'll be right back. He hustles out with a mischievous smirk. Adelaide passes Zora's room. Where's your brother? Zora shrugs. Adelaide opens the basement door. Adelaide walks down to the basement. There is a washer, a dryer, and a table for folding laundry in front of a mirrored wall. She finds a box and opens it. There are pictures of her as a child in a ballerina tutu. There's also an old stuffed bunny. She smiles with melancholic nostalgia. Out of nowhere, young Adelaide spins through the space. There was a mini ballet practice studio. Zora enters and shuts the door. She looks in the mirror. She leans in, examining a blemish, when Jason bursts out of a cabinet and scampers out the door. Adelaide watches her 14-year-old self, teen Adelaide, dance, now with perfect pirouettes. Footsteps thump above. Jason enters the closet. The door begins to creak shut, but he pulls a toy ambulance in the crack, propping the door open for a sliver of light. Jason pulls his mask down and resumes snapping. After a few unsuccessful snaps, he pauses. Zora walks down the hall and nonchalantly bumps the toy ambulance into the closet with her heel. The closet door shuts. Jason grabs the doorknob from inside, jiggling it. It's locked. Adelaide watches teen Adelaide dance when Jason screams upstairs. Adelaide is startled. Adelaide passes the open doorway to Zora's room. She's pissed. You can't help him! Zora is laying on the bed with headphones on. She turns as her mom passes by. What happened? Adelaide opens the closet door. Jason sits there. Oh, baby, that's why you can't play in there. Jason's tears turn to rage. Didn't this happen last year? Zora, please. The moment is broken by a distant buzz that starts small but gets closer. Hey! The three of them look at each other. Adelaide, Zora, and Jason stand on the dock by their house. Gabe, a pillar of pride, stands triumphantly at the steering wheel of a small motorboat that buzzes around in circles. He beams while Adelaide, Zora, and Jason remain thoroughly unimpressed. Well, <laughs> what do you think? Craw, Daddy. Adelaide unimpressed. Wow. It's got a cassette player and everything. All it needs is a new coat of paint. They just watch him. He holds up a life preserver. Hey, Jay, look! It even came with one of these! The boat engine sputters to a halt. Smoke bellows from it. Zora. He's kidding, right? Adelaide under her breath. He's not kidding. Hold up, he told me how to fix this. Gabe goes to the back of the boat and pounds it with his fist a couple times. Don't worry, I got it real cheap. I hope so. She veers a little to the left, so you have to stay on it, but other than that, it's perfect. You think? Also, uh, Josh got a boat, so we can do a dual family voyage. Ah, I see. Josh's boat is probably way better. What? He said Josh's boat is probably better. It's not a contest. It's something I thought would be nice for the family. But will we all fit, though? Okay, you know what? Y'all are spoiled. 
the engine starts up again. Gabe almost falls. Adelaide and Zora are amused. Gabe pouts as he drives through a road lined with redwood trees. The rest of the family chills in their seats. Jason snaps in the back. Zora reads. Adelaide checks in on Gabe's mood. Do you know this country produces like twice as much waste per capita as any other country in the developed world? No one responds. Jason looks at her dryly. I forgot no one cares about the environment. Since when did you become such a tree hugger? I like it, I'm just saying. Zora watches Jason continue to snap. Maybe you could just tell us what's supposed to happen and we can picture it. He keeps snapping. I mean, at a certain point, kiss my anus, Zora. Oh! What? Zora is shocked and Adelaide tries to hide her smile. Why are we even talking about anuses? Anus isn't a curse word. That does not matter. Disgusting. See, I would have preferred a curse word in this case. Jason to Adelaide. I could see you laughing in the mirror. Gabe leans on the horn. Okay, you know what? We don't always need to be talking. There are families that enjoy silence. The rest of them look around. Yeesh. Adelaide knows her family. She turns on the radio. I Got Five on It by Lunis is on. Gabe's mood immediately lifts. I've got five on it. He grooves in his seat. Zora and Jason share a look. What does I Got Five on it mean? It's about drugs. It's a dope song. Don't do drugs. Jason, get it in rhythm. Adelaide starts snapping to the rhythm. Jason follows along. Gabe loosens up and sits dancing, singing along. I got five on it. Zora and Adelaide share a look through the rearview mirror. Adelaide shrugs. Zora rolls her eyes in pleasant conceit. The car drives past more redwood trees. They emerge from the wood-lined road and overlook downtown Santa Cruz's amusement park, boardwalk, and beach. The roller coaster looms menacingly in the distance. Adelaide hides her apprehension as they head towards the scene of her past horror. The car arrives at the crosswalk. A crossing guard steps out in front of the car and he stops them. They wait while a line of on-leave sailors crosses the street in front of the Wilson's car. Why can't I drive in the parking lot? You're not old enough. I'm not talking to you. Hmm, let me think about that for a second. Uh, no. Why? Because I cherish my life. As the sailors pass, Adelaide watches the town go by and remains preoccupied with thought. Flashback. Rain drives from the rainy beach. We can't quite hear words, but we can tell that Russell is drunk. He and Rain argue. Young Adelaide sits in the back seat in total shock. Gabe. Ah, damn it. Adelaide snaps out of her daydream. They've just turned a corner and end up stuck behind an ambulance and a cop car that block the street. Oh my god. A couple of cops are taking statements from locals on sidewalks who witness the incident at hand. Two EMTs load an unconscious, bleeding homeless man into the ambulance. Don't look. Don't look. You've got to be kidding me. Cop waves the car past. Jason watches the man. The Wilsons, having parked, step onto the sand, carrying folding chairs and other beach gear. As they walk, Adelaide fights the urge to look behind her. Eventually, she steals a nonchalant glance back in the direction of where the vision quest was when she was a child. The attraction is still there, but its name has been changed to Merlin's Forest. It still has the same Find Yourself sign, but the shaman has been replaced by an old white wizard who still points his finger outwards like a bizarro Uncle Sam. Was that guy dead? Who? The guy in the ambulance. Ambulance means he's alive, right? Jason, unsure, nods and starts snapping again. They arrive at the Tyler family's beach setup. Umbrella, chairs, and a stocked cooler already set up in tidy order. Josh Tyler, Caucasian, 40. Kitty Tyler, Caucasian, 40. Sit. Josh and Kitty are both a couple drinks in. The Tyler twins, Lindsay and Becca, Caucasian, 14, play by the water. Hey! Hey! 
You said 230. Where's your efficiency, man? Efficiency. We got held up. I'm kidding. Don't worry about it. Hey, girl. We made it. Oh, my God, Zora. You've gotten so big. You look so pretty. Zora hates the compliment. Thanks. Hey, Jason, you want a beer? Um, Kitty to Zora. Lindsay and Becca will be happy to see you. Adelaide to Jason. No, the answer is no. To Josh. Please give me a couple more years. Kitty to Becca and Lindsay. Guys, look who's here. Josh to Jason. Ah, kid, here's a soda. Becca flies a kite. Lindsay does cartwheels. They wave. Zora gives her mom an I hate these bitches look before walking over to them. Hi, Jason. Jason waves shyly as he walks off. Later, the two families chill on the beach. Zora sits near the twins who practice gymnastics. Jason plays nearby in the sand. Gabe and Josh pal around, pouring beers into plastic cups and cracking each other up. Have you taken her on the maiden voyage yet? Just rode her home, but we're going to do the family thing soon. Cool, we could do a double excursion. Yeah, I mean, it's small, but it's a real classic design. Hey, it's not about the size of the boat. Fuck out of here. Josh laughs. Hey, Kitty. Kitty, who is talking to Adelaide, looks over. You hear Gabe got a boat? Oh, cool. He says, it's small. I say, it's not the size of the boat. Kitty to Josh. You thought that bared repeating? He thought it did. He really did. Screw all of you. Adelaide glances back again, still distracted by the Merlin's forest. Kitty clocks it. Merlin's forest? I think that changed. It used to be called Vision Quest. Oh, how culturally insensitive of them. Yeah, totally. Hey, Addy. Beer, wine, vodka, cran, mimosa. I got everything. Do you have water? Uh, I've got ice. He hands her a cup of ice, then passes Kitty a drink. He pulls her drink away before giving it to her. The old lame practical joke. I hate you. To Adelaide. It never stops. I honestly think about murdering him sometimes. Adelaide laughs. So nothing's new. Actually, since you asked... Kitty smiles. She turns her head, showcasing her face from different angles. What? Oh my god, did you have something done? Just an itsy bitsy thing. Fuck off, you look the exact same as you did last year. That's the idea. A little bit goes a long way. Not that you need it, you beautiful motherfucker. Adelaide quietly doesn't accept the compliment. She looks around the beach. Stop, I can already tell the things you think are flaws are so annoying. Adelaide almost says something, but doesn't. What? Nothing. I'm kidding. Tell me. Sometimes I have a hard time talking. You ever wonder what if, what if things just happen differently? I don't know what you mean. You mean the what if I never got married and had kids question? Uh, yeah. I'm having it literally right now. Trust me. The girls have just gotten to the age where I feel like I can finally go to the spa once a week for me time. Me time? What's that? It's mandatory. Becca approaches Jason. Lindsay does cartwheels. She stands on the sand structure she's making. Lindsay to Jason. Oops. Oh, shit. My bad. Lindsay continues cartwheeling back and forth. It doesn't matter. Becca offers Jason the kite reel. Want to try? It's pretty dumb, but you might like it. Oh, okay. The wind's good. Jason tries to fly the kite. Lindsay cartwheels over to Zora, who reads on the beach. Your brother's so weird. He has a problem focusing. They look over at Jason, who tries to fly the kite while watching his own hand snap. Are you going into the water? Uh, I'm good. Why not? Jason gets up and walks away from the water. Where are you going? To the bathroom. Why don't you pee in the ocean? Jinx! Kitty and Adelaide don't notice. You ever wish you kept dancing? Sometimes. I mean, you were like really good, right? I peaked at 14. Didn't we all? Jason passes by them as he heads towards the porta potties. 
Jason takes a long walk past sunbathers and other people to the porta potty near the boardwalk, becoming increasingly remote from the group. When he arrives at the porta potty, a sour old lady emerges. He lets her pass, then goes inside. Adelaide continues with Kitty. There was this one competition where I did a piece from the Nutcracker. I love the Nutcracker. You know the Grand Pas de Deux? It's the pretty one at the end of the ballet. Oh, where she flies into the prince's arms. Yeah. Okay, can I tell you, I cry at that part every time. Josh erupts from afar. You cry? Really? To Josh. No one's talking to you. You were saying? The grand pas is supposed to be a dance for two, but I turned it into a solo. Um, that's badass. Nerve-wracking. I thought I'd get disqualified, but when I finished, the audience went crazy. I won the first prize. It was the best moment of my life. Besides Zora and Jason's birth. The girls don't make my top ten, by the way. I'm convinced I would be a movie star if I didn't have them at exactly the wrong time. Adelaide starts watching people on the beach around them as Kitty drones on. A guy chases his girlfriend who screams. A small group of people laugh hard. A teen play fights with his brother. Each vignette seems to make Adelaide increasingly nervous, but she hides it well. I trained at Stella Adler and booked two commercials before I met Josh and then totally stopped audition when I got preggers. And then the move to San Francisco was like a fucking career killer. The whole thing was supposed to be... I would fly out for auditions, but that never happened. I put myself on tape for like half a year, but it's really not the same. You have to be in the room for things to fall into place. A red frisbee falls onto the towel they're sitting on. Adelaide is startled. Jesus! Oh, look! Adelaide looks down. The frisbee has landed perfectly on one of the towel's large, printed polka dots. Adelaide picks it up, revealing the same colored dot underneath. It really is eerily perfect. Adelaide is quite concerned. Whoa, that's crazy. We've been having so many weird coincidences happening lately. A guy runs over to claim the frisbee. Adelaide gives it to him. Thanks. He leaves. Adelaide looks over and sees the twins playing near Zora. No, Jason. No, I'm sorry. (laughs) Dick. Anyways, we should go back to our place. I think it's vodka o'clock. Where's Jason? Jason comes out of the porta potty and starts walking back to the beach, but stops when he notices something strange. A man stands facing away from him on the beach about 20 yards away. The man has his arms stretched out at his sides in a relaxed manner, like a yoga pose. Other people walk around him, only occasionally noticing him. Jason is transfixed. He walks slowly and wide around the man, trying to see his face. It's tense. Adelaide looks around with increasing concern. Where's Jason? He's... Gabe, where's Jason? Jason looks around. Adelaide calling out, Jason! Jason! Jason takes another step towards the strange man with outstretched arms. He can almost see his profile. He stops when he notices the man has dried blood on his hands. Jason! Jason runs back scared. Jason arrives back at Adelaide's side. Where were you? I went to the bathroom. No, you don't do that. You don't run off without telling me. She shakes him. Ow! Jason's shoulder is hurt. He looks scared. Adelaide looks around. Everybody nearby watches. She catches her breath and hugs him. Don't do that to me, understand? Josh and Kitty look at each other. Little awkward. Eh, it's a long day. Uh, let's get together tomorrow. Kitty, to the watchers. Show's over, thanks. The Wilsons drive home. The Wilsons are sunbeaten and tired. They're all still a little shaken from Adelaide's freakout. The radio is on. And authorities are in an active investigation of several stabbings that occurred earlier today, originally thought to be unrelated, but authorities now say they are investigating possible links. Adelaide turns the radio off. The Wilsons pull into the driveway. All is quiet. Gabe suddenly turns to the kids in the back. Gabe lays on the couch watching TV. Adelaide closes the curtains. 
You saw their new car, right? He had to do it. He just had to get that thing to fuck with me, too. Jason runs down the hallway to his room. I guess mission accomplished. Yelling to Jason. Don't run! Zora comes out of the bathroom and stops by Jason's. As Jason lands on his bed, Zora enters. Way to freak mom out. She leaves. You good? Adelaide nods unconvincingly. Yeah, I'm going to say goodnight. Adelaide starts down the hallway. Okay, I'm just uh, waiting for the Giants highlights. I'll uh, see you in the magic room. Adelaide peeks in. Zora is under her blanket. It glows with the light of a phone. Night, night. Good night. Phone off. After a beat, the light goes off. Adelaide walks away. The light goes back on. Jason sits on his bed by his window. Look! He points to his digital alarm clock, which displays 1111. Adelaide pauses. Past your bedtime. Jason tries to snap his spark starter. If you want, we can go into town tomorrow and get you a new one. It's okay. Grandma got me this one. Adelaide enters and sits on his bed. Mask off. She takes his mask off, rubs his head, and kisses it. You thought I was dead? Oh no, I, I didn't know if you were lost or taken. By bad people, right? Like terrorists or psychos? Yes, there are. As long as you're with me, I'll keep you safe, okay? Jason nods. Adelaide gets up and goes to the door. She sees a drawing of a stick figure facing another stick figure who faces away from the first. Who's this? Jason shrugs. Adelaide goes to the window and closes the curtains. Jason looks at her. He's confused, but nods in agreement. Adelaide, shook, nods as well. Adelaide stares out the window. Gabe enters, brushing his teeth. You know, I was thinking about getting fishing gear tomorrow. Four rods, we could all go. We could fish from the dock. Of course, there's the boat too. If we can get out in the open water, just saying. I'm not trying to force anyone. He notices Adelaide's stillness. Hey. She doesn't answer. Just stares out the window, transfixed. Gabe looks in the direction she's looking, but sees nothing. I want to go. Go where? Home. I can't be here, it's too much. You serious? Being here, it's like there's this black cloud hanging over me, and I don't feel like myself. Well, I, I think you're you. Gabe, I need to tell you something. I just need you to listen. Uh, okay. When I was a kid, I went to that boardwalk with my parents. I wandered off. I don't know why, but I, I did, and I ended up in that hall of mirrors, and... We're in a flashback. Young Adelaide stands in a dark, mirror-lined hallway, as we last left off. She faces the back of the other girl's head. Back to present day. Adelaide stares out the window. Gabe's on the bed. There was another girl in there. She looked like me. Exactly like me. Flashback. Adelaide stares, stunned by the back of what she thought was a reflection. Now the other girl begins turning towards Adelaide, revealing an intense, hateful smile that pierces through the darkness. She's shrouded in darkness, but from what we can make out, looks just like Adelaide. Back to the present. Gabe, on the bed, is confused and silent for a moment. You were in a house of mirrors. No, she wasn't a reflection. She was real. In the flashback, before Adelaide can scream, the other girl grabs her by the throat with both hands and screams in her face with gleeful rage. Present day. Adelaide confides in Gabe. She tried to kill me. She tried to choke me. I got away. I, I ran as fast as I could. My whole life I felt like she's still coming for me. Whatever happened, it was a long time ago. You know when things line up, the coincidences... Since we've been up here, they've been happening more and more. I think she's getting closer. The girl who looks like you? You don't believe me. I, I do, I do. I'm, ju I'm just processing. He looks at her. You know I'm here, right? I mean, I'm pretty sure I could kick your ass, so if she looks like you... Okay, not funny. My bad. I'm just trying to lighten the mood. The lights cut out. 
Ah, oh, shit. No. Perfect timing. See, this is why Josh has a backup generator. Gabe starts towards the door. Jason stands in the doorway. Gabe is startled. Jesus, we lost power. I'm going to fix it. Go to bed. There's a family in our driveway. Adelaide and Gabe look at each other. Adelaide, Gabe, and Jason stare out the front door window. Four people stand near the edge of the property, silhouetted by the moonlight. Their contour seems to fit the same familial hunched and wavering. Next to him, a father, hulking with head tilted oddly. Next, a mother, still and poised. On the right, a daughter, thin and sleek. Adelaide watches in horror. Gabe to himself, Huh? Now who's that? We have to get out of here. Hold on, it's just a family. You're scared of a family? A boogeyman's family? Zora enters from the hallway. What? Zora, give me your phone. I'm on it. Zora! She hands Adelaide the phone. Adelaide calls 911. Who's that? It's just a family. It's standing outside. It's probably neighbors. You're kidding me, right? I'm scared. Hello, my name is Adelaide Wilson. We're at 2311 Seagull Way. Whoa, you're really calling 911? Look, everything's good. We lost power. All right, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to find out what they want. Let's try and not freak out. There are four trespassers on our property. Yes? No, we don't. Can you send someone immediately? I don't think we're safe. Gabe unlocks the door. Gabe? Dad? They probably need help. Hang tight. Gabe walks out. Gabe opens the front door and steps out, trying to look confident and casual. Out here trying to have a vacation, my whole family's lost their damn minds. The four figures stand there, evenly spaced, about 15 yards away from the house. Hey! The figures look dead at him. Can I help you? Nothing. Fourteen minutes. No. Tell them to come faster. Mom. Okay, yes. Yes, hurry. Gabe! Gabe takes a couple steps towards the strangers. Nothing. If y'all are out here trying to scare people, you picked the wrong house for that. Gabe squints to see their faces. Gabe losing confidence as he goes. Okay, I asked you nice. Now I'm going to need you to get... Get off my property. Gabe almost says something else, but the lack of motion or response from the strangers tells him something might in fact be very wrong. Gabe goes into the house. He's shook. That's not how he expected that to go. Okay, let's call the cops. I did. They're 14 minutes away. What? 14 minutes? Okay, Jason, give me the bat. The bat? The baseball bat. The bat. The one in the... Here. Zora rushes, gets the bat from the closet, and brings it to Gabe. Gabe. Okay, hold on. I'm going to try again. No. It's okay. It's okay. Gabe starts out the door. He walks out. He means business this time. The cops will be here any minute, so they'll know you're trespassing and harassing us. Again, they do nothing. Okay, well, suit yourself. If I were you, I'd... All of a sudden, with a quick and coordinated dart, the bad family, in quotes, break formation. Gabe shudders. The bad daughter goes left, and the bad son gets on all fours and scurries right. Gabe falls back instinctively as the bad father comes directly towards him. Hey, hey, hey! Gabe backs up into the house and shuts the door just as the bad father arrives with the slam. They're going around. Is the back door locked? My window's open! Zora takes off running towards her room. Zora, no! Adelaide leaves Jason to pursue Zora. Zora makes it to her window and locks it just as the bad daughter climbs up a tree with lizard speed. Zora starts backing out of the room, terrified, as Adelaide comes and grabs her. The front door thumps rhythmically. I'm serious, man. I will break your damn head. Jason looks out a nearby window. He gets closer to the glass and tries to peek out. Suddenly, the bad son's head pops up close. He wears a rubber burn mask. Adelaide rushes in with Zora and pulls Jason close. A sharp whistle cuts through the silence. That familiar tune, Itsy Bitsy Spider, terrorizes Adelaide. It's her. The bad mother, 
walks slowly past the windows towards the front door. A few footsteps thump on the roof. We can't see their faces, but the bad mother arrives at the front door. The bad father stops banging the door. She lifts a rock near the front steps. Gabe takes a few deep breaths while the family huddles behind him in the living room. Suddenly from outside, a key goes in the lock. The key! What key? The damn hide a key! Hide a key? What kind of white shit? The door opens with force. Gabe tries to hold it shut, but the bad father opens it anyway. He swings at the bad father, who catches the bat and takes it away, as if Gabe were a child. He brings the bat down on Gabe's knee with a crack. Gabe goes down. Ugh! Adelaide, Zora, and Jason back up into the living room. To their left, the bad son, obscured by curtains, scurries past the window. To their right, a skylight crashes. The bad daughter falls into the kitchen. The bad father and the bad daughter back the Wilsons into the living room as the bad son scurries past the window. Adelaide holds her children close as Gabe tries to get up. Wincing, he stumbles back into the living room in agony. The bad father follows him into the room slowly, bat in hand. Mom? It's okay, just stay close. The bad daughter turns into the living room. The bad mother enters. She is red. Adelaide's doppelganger. She walks in a calm, erudite manner. The clear head of her family. It's dark. Red arrives at the chair in front of them and she sits. She motions for them to sit. The bad son smashes a hole in the back porch door window and enters. The Wilsons sit on the couch. Except for Gabe, who tries to stand aided by the arm of the couch. The bad son lights a match in his hand with a snap. The fireplace erupts in flames. The fire backlights the bad family. The bad son shuffles to Red's side and sits like a dog. She strokes his masked head. We still can't really see their features in full, but at this point it's clear that these home invaders are doppelgangers of the Wilsons. Abraham, Gabe's doppelganger, seems a little out of it. His attention wanders like a rampage killer lost in some sort of psychotic break. Umbre, Zora's doppelganger, stands with perfect posture, sleeked back hair, and an evil little smirk. Pluto, Jason's doppelganger, breathes thick under his mask. He carries himself like an animal. The entire bad family wear red jumpsuits, with sandals and one glove. Zora starts freaking out. What? Jason under his breath. It's us. Gabe isn't ready to believe what's in front of him. We don't have anything here. This is our summer home. We, we got in today, so... Gabe... Red clears her throat, silencing Gabe. She speaks. Her voice is quiet and craggy, like it's never been used. Once upon a time, there was a girl, and the girl had a shadow. The two were connected, tethered together, so whatever happened to the girl happened to the shadow. When the girl ate, her food was given to her warm and tasty, but when the shadow was hungry, she had to eat rabbits raw and bloody. On Christmas the girl received wonderful toys, soft and cushy, but the shadow's toys were so sharp and cold they'd slice through her fingers when she played with them. Time passed, they both got older, and one day the girl met a handsome prince and fell in love. At that same time the shadow met Abraham. It didn't matter if she loved him or not, he was tethered to the girl's prince after all. Then the girl had her first child, a beautiful baby girl, but the shadow, she gave birth to a little monster. Umbra was born laughing. The girl had a second child, a boy this time. They had to cut her open and take him from her belly. The shadow had to do it all herself. She named him Pluto. He was born to love fire. Pluto growls at Gabe. So you see... The shadow hated the girl so much for so long, until one day she realized that she wasn't being punished by the girl at all. She was being tested by God. Gabe tries to present a nonchalant tone and pull Red's attention off Adelaide. Look, uh, here's my wallet. <laughs> Take the car, Gabe. 
Take whatever you want. Hell, you can take the boat for all I care. Zora through tears. Nobody wants the boat, Dad. Uh, how about this? Uh, take me to the ATM. Uh, I'll give you all the cash I can take out, and, and you can go. We won't, s- we won't say shit. Gabe, who has been in denial of the supernatural element at play, loses steam. What are you people? He finally gets Red's attention. She turns her head, disappointed with the question. What are we? Red leans in. We're Americans. Red holds bronze-colored handcuffs. She gives them to Pluto, who walks to Adelaide and stands on the table. Tether yourself to the table. Addy, no, don't. Or maybe I should cut something off you. Abraham takes a step towards Gabe. Just don't hurt the children. Adelaide puts the handcuffs on one wrist and connects them to the heavy coffee table. Hey! Hey! Abraham grabs Gabe by the wrist. Gabe tries to resist, but his knee is jacked and he's simply not as strong. Hey! Don't touch me! Get off! No! Abraham pulls Gabe out the back living room door and off the back porch. It's easy, as if he's dragging a toddler in full tantrum. Okay, okay! Red to Zora. Little girl. Zora shrinks in fear. Mom? Run. Umbre takes a menacing step towards Zora, who gets up off the couch. Zora looks at Adelaide, who nods at her. Zora quickly runs to the front door. Umbre slinks after her. Adelaide to Red. You want me, right? Zora bursts out the door and runs fast down the street. Umbre walks down the middle of the street and watches her run. She stretches her arms and legs. Adelaide holds Jason tight on the couch. Red pets Pluto. Go play, boys. Pluto hops on the coffee table and holds his hands out to Jason like a trained animal. Mom? No, he's not going. Be careful, he has a temper. Pluto starts to growl. Adelaide holds it together, but her voice shakes. She looks in Jason's eyes, which he diverts. Okay, it's okay. Look at me. You're going to be okay. Show him one of your tricks. Adelaide gives Jason a look that seems to say, be smart. Jason's scared, but he stands. Pluto grunts jovially and follows him upstairs. Don't burn the house down. Red and Adelaide are alone in the living room. They sit across from one another in silence. Abraham kicks Gabe, who can barely stand, down the back porch stairs. Abraham follows him down slowly. Wait, 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 wait! Abraham knocks Gabe out with the blunt end of his scissors. He looks over at some garbage nearby. Zora is about a hundred yards away and still running. At the end of the street is a house. Umbre slowly walks back and forth, stretching her arms in anticipation. She watches Zora get smaller in the distance. Gabe can be heard struggling on the other side of the house. No, no! Red watches Adelaide near Gabe's cries. Pluto leads Jason into the closet. Jason moves a sock in the drawer crack with his foot so the door can't shut all the way. Pluto breathes heavily under the mask. Jason raises his arm, and Pluto does the same, mirroring him. Zora is now almost gone down the street. Umbre finishes pacing and joint cracking. What do you want? Red watches her. What? Years ago, I had a vision. In this vision, I saw a line of blood in the soil that stretched as far as I could see. Red stands. She slowly walks to Adelaide's side. During this vision, God spoke to me. He said, the only way for a soul to truly be free is to sever the tie. And his voice, it was the most beautiful sound I've ever heard. A moment of silence. Red places her hand on Adelaide's head and slowly pushes it to the table. I call it the untethering. Pluto holds a lit match. Jason is so scared, but starts to lift Pluto's mask. Before we can see his face, the match goes out. It's dark again. 
Pluto strikes another match and illuminates his awful face. It's identical to Jason's, but the bottom half is covered in burn scars. Jason whimpers. Zora is out of breath. Her running slows to a walk. She turns to look behind her, but doesn't see anything. She turns forward and keeps walking, just as we see a shadowy figure come into view in the distance behind her, closing in fast. After a few paces, she turns around, just as the figure runs wide behind her. Again, she sees nothing. Crying, she turns back to proceed and finds herself face to face with Umbre, who is curled around in front of her. Zora screams. Red continues to push Adelaide's face on the coffee table. I wondered if you did too. See this day coming. The glass starts to splinter. Red is so strong. With a little steam left, Zora runs around the car. Umbre goes to the other side of it. Zora sees Umbre stalking her through the windows. Suddenly, Umbre goes down, disappearing behind the door. Zora, terrified, goes down too. She looks underneath, but sees nothing. No feet. Zora looks up. Umbre is on the roof of the car, leaning over her. The motorboat buzzes. Gabe comes in to pitch black. He pokes a hole. He's in a garbage bag, lying in the back of his own boat. He looks through the torn hole at Abraham, who stands at the steering wheel with his back to Gabe. Gabe looks around. The bat is propped up by Abraham, who also has his scissors in his hand. There's a life preserver, flotation device attached to a coiled rope and tethered to the boat. Gabe starts slowly and quietly to pull himself out of the bag. He peers behind them. The lights of the shore are far and getting further away. He reaches for the flotation device and slowly pulls it towards him. Suddenly, the boat's motor coughs. It's failing. Abraham turns as Gabe shrinks back into the garbage bag. Abraham walks over. He doesn't notice the coil of unwound rope he's standing inside of. Abraham begins banging the motor exactly the way Gabe did earlier. It's being stubborn. Gabe slowly crawls forward and gets the bat. He sneaks up behind Abraham and swings just as Abraham turns around, knocking him off the boat. As he falls, the rope tangles around Abraham's foot, clenching into a knot. The flotation device and rope goes overboard with him. Ha <laughs> ha! Fuck you! Gabe hits the motor with the bat in triumph. The motor revs into action. The boat takes off, sending Gabe off the back and into the water. The boat drives away. Gabe wades frantically. He looks around, but doesn't see Abraham. Then, suddenly, Abraham surfaces and swings his scissors at Gabe. The boat is now far enough away that the rope around Abraham's ankle goes taut and he is pulled away. Gabe is left there, bobbing in the water, as the boat pulls Abraham away on his belly, like an unwilling water skier. Gabe watches as the boat whirs away into the dark night water. Goodbye. Pluto continues to mirror Jason's wrist. Jason starts his snapping. Pluto snaps, lighting a match. Pluto is intrigued. The snapping continues, but nothing happens. Pluto's guttural breaths build to an angry grunt. Umbre gets closer and closer to Zora. Just then, Dawn, a large old man, comes out of a nearby house. The fuck? Get out of my car! Umbre turns. Zora takes the moment to flee back towards the house. Come here, come here! Umbre gets off the car, ready to pursue Zora. Dawn walks towards Umbre. Hey, kid, I'm talking to you. Umbre stops at kid. Now she's angry. As Zora runs, huffing and puffing, Umbre goes down and severs his Achilles tendon with her scissors. He screams and falls to the ground. Moments later, Gabe hears the boat's motor getting louder again. He prepares himself and faces the boat, but when it's about 25 yards from him, the motor sputters out again. The boat slows to a glide and stops near him. Gabe looks for Abraham, but doesn't see him. The life preserver floats by. No Abraham. Gabe grabs the rope and pulls himself towards the boat. He climbs up the back of the boat just as Abraham attacks him from behind. Gabe hangs on the back of the boat with Abraham hanging onto him. Gabe hits the motor twice, and it turns on. Abraham, whose torso is pressed against the propeller, gets slashed across the chest and face as he falls back into the water. Gabe exhausted, 
falls into the boat as it drives away. As Pluto grunts, Jason begins snapping. Wait, wait, look! Pluto becomes curious and watches Jason's hand. Jason snaps faster and faster, when suddenly, the trick works. A few sparks fly from Jason's fingers, catching Pluto entirely off guard. He's startled. Jason uses the moment to knock him over and run out of the closet. In the living room, Red holds Adelaide down. The coffee table cracks even more. Blood starts to pool on the side of Adelaide's face. Jason trips and falls into the hallway. Pluto, confused, gets up and lunges towards Jason, but Jason pulls the sock out with his toes and slams the door just in time with his other foot. Adelaide and Red hear the scream. They watch each other for a moment. That's yours. Red still for a moment, then suddenly she stands and leaves the room headed towards Pluto. Now alone, Adelaide leaps into action. First, she tries to get out of the cuffs, but can't. She tries to break the table with her foot. She sees the fire poker across the room and goes towards it, but is stopped again by the heavy table. Red opens the closet. Pluto's inside. He stops yelling. He exits and looks around, sniffing the air. Jason is nowhere to be seen. Pluto skitters into Jason's room. Red starts walking down the hallway in search of Jason. She takes a step into Zora's room. Red comes out. She sees the basement door is open and goes inside. Adelaide sees the phone. She grabs it, dials 911 again, and drags the coffee table a little. As the phone rings, she slowly pulls the coffee table towards the fire poker. All of our operators are currently busy. Please hang on line. Adelaide is close enough to almost reach. Come on! She grabs the fire poker, barely. She darts over to the coffee table and uses the poker and all of her strength to quietly pry the wooden leg off the table. Adelaide does enough damage to the coffee table to free herself. Red walks through the basement looking for Jason. She finds the box of keepsakes picks up a stuffed bunny, and looks at it. Adelaide looks down the hallway. She sees no one. She whispers, Jason! Jason! She sees Jason's silhouette emerge from the cabinet in the bathroom. Relief, but as he comes closer, she begins to realize that it might not be him. She clutches her fire poker ready to strike, but as he steps through the moonlight, it is Jason. Just then, Pluto scrambles out of his room and towards them like a feral raccoon. Adelaide pulls down the bookshelf in the hallway, blocking Pluto, who tries to scurry around it. Adelaide grabs Jason and runs to the front door, as Red emerges from the basement. They shut the door hard as Pluto gets near. Where's Zora? Zora? She ran. Adelaide brings Jason to the car, but as they get there, the lights bleep. They look back. Red is in the doorway, holding the keys. Mom! Zora runs back, out of breath. She's crazy! She's crazy! Suddenly, they hear the familiar buzz of the boat. The Wilsons race towards the dock. Pluto takes off after them, on all fours. They get to the boat just in the nick of time. Pluto lunges at them, but misses. As the boat pulls away, Pluto stops at the edge of the dock. He moans a menacing, angry moan at them. Red walks calmly down the length of the dock. As the Wilsons huddle in their boat, Umbre arrives too, back from her run. Zora screams. Umbre paces impatiently. She laughs at Zora. The Wilsons are silent with shock, except for Gabe. These motherfuckers, these motherfuckers, these motherfuckers. The boat drives away. Red, Umbre, and Pluto watch. Abraham washes up on shore. Blood pours from the gashes on his chest and face. The bad family watch his body emotionlessly. Umbre begins to run in pursuit, but disappears in the woods. Pluto stares at his father. The Tyler Bayside House The house has a modern, clean interior, and the lights are all on. There are museum-scale, elegant, abstract paintings hanging everywhere. A second level overlooks the large main room, below, and turns into a hallway leading to the bedrooms. Josh sleeps in a reclining chair, holding a glass of whiskey. The power dims and then comes right back on. The backup generator hums to life. 
Josh wakes up and immediately starts drinking. Kitty enters from upstairs. Josh? Josh looks up to Kitty on the upper level. What was that? What? I thought I heard something outside. Okay, something. Uh, rustling, walking, like a person. A person's outside our fucking house. Josh gets up skeptically and goes to the window. Ophelia, lights up. A female voice comes out of a circular white speaker. Turning lights up. The lights fade. Kitty comes downstairs. And the lights dipped. I think the backup generator went on. Why are you talking about the backup generator? You don't know anything about the backup generator. Can you stop being an asshole for two seconds and look? Josh and Kitty both look. What? Uh, did you see that? What? Oh my god. Uh, what? It's O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson is out there. He laughs. She looks at him. What's wrong with you? Seriously. Ophelia, play Beach Boys. Really? Playing Good Vibrations by the Beach Boys. The Beach Boys' Good Vibrations comes on over the system. Ophelia, turn it down. Turning down Good Vibrations by the Beach Boys. It's okay, just go back to sleep. Everything will be fine. The twins enter, approaching the railing along the mezzanine landing. What's going on? Nothing. Jesus, the backup generator went on and we're trying to figure it out. Go back to sleep. Just because we're in our rooms doesn't mean we're sleeping. Fine, I don't care. Go back to your rooms. I just want to remind everyone that we're leaving at 10 a.m. sharp. Josh turns to look up at his daughters on the mezzanine level. A third twin lurks right behind Becca. There's a moment of confusion. From outside looking in, what commences next can only be described as a seven-second massacre. Three more figures enter from strategic positions. They, along with the third twin, are the bad versions of the Tylers. They quickly and efficiently subdue and stab their counterparts in the necks with brass scissors, blood spatters, and sprays against the white walls. The bad Tylers stand looking at each other for a moment. Good Vibrations continues playing. Kitty Tyler is still alive. She chokes on blood as she crawls towards her husband's body. Tex, Josh's doppelganger, moves in front of her and holds out his hand. She reaches for it, but he pulls it away sadistically, pushing it through his hair. Stop, please. Stopping good vibrations by the Beach Boys. The music stops. Dahlia, Kitty's doppelganger, walks over to her. She has stitches running down both sides of her face and suppresses a laugh with wild-eyed intensity. Kitty is getting weaker. The inevitability is sinking in. Ophelia, call the police. Dahlia leans over and finishes the murder. Adelaide knocks on the front door frantically. Fuck the police by NWA plays inside. Jason and Zora help a limping Gabe up the bayside lawn towards Adelaide and the house. Tex opens the door in Josh's robe. Josh, we need some help. We're attacked in our home. Tex's jaw drops in a shocked expression, like he can't even process. As he opens the door, Adelaide sees some blood on his fingers. Adelaide steps back from Tex, who projects an overtly sympathetic face and grabs her wrist. Adelaide swings her fire poker at Tex. It strikes him in the head hard. A trickle of blood rolls down his face, but he's still conscious. Tex grabs the fire poker and her wrist. He tosses Adelaide over the threshold and onto the floor inside the house. Hey! Dahlia and the bad twins, Nix and Io, pounce on Adelaide and pull her deeper inside, towards the staircase. Josh slams the door behind him, staying outside. He takes his scissors and drops the fire poker. Sora screams. Tex looks at her with sadistic glee. Tex starts making his way towards Gabe and the kids. With each step he takes, he makes a different, taunting, exaggerated expression, like some kind of evil mime. Gabe to Zora and Jason. Run! Zora and Jason, stunned, begin to run towards the driveway. Josh begins to follow them with his wild-eyed taunt. Hey, what are you doing? You think you're a man? Come get some then. Try me, bitch! Tex can't help himself. He turns away from the kids and obliges Gabe, 
who backs up towards the dock. Tex, delighted with the taunt, taunts back. He bellows a weird clicking noise at Gabe. Crazy. Click, click, click. He follows Gabe down the hill. The kids look back at their father, who is successfully baiting Tex out towards the Tyler's dock. Then, they look back at each other. Jason is about to cry again, but Zora hits him in the chest firmly, startling him out of it. An unspoken agreement. They walk to the house. Zora picks up the fire poker off the lawn. Dahlia sits in front of her makeup mirror. She's lost, like in a Marilyn Monroe haze. She applies some makeup to her crazy face, like she's at the peak of her glamorous career. Adelaide sits on the floor, now with both wrists in the cuffs and bound to the dresser. She looks around while Dahlia is mesmerized by her Hollywood dream. Adelaide accidentally makes a noise. Dahlia snaps out of her daydream and looks at Adelaide with rediscovery. She approaches Adelaide and puts her scissors up to her face. She tries to decide where and how to cut Adelaide. Gabe stumbles down the dock where his boat and Josh's boat are docked. Tex follows. Gabe steps onto Josh's boat. Kitty wants to cut Adelaide so bad, but she stops herself. Frustrated, she goes to the window. She's waiting for someone to arrive. Not here yet. She's getting impatient. Dahlia goes to the dressing room mirror and puts the scissors up to her face, ready to cut into her own cheek. Adelaide looks away. Zora and Jason open the door. The room is a bloody mess. The original Josh and Kitty Tyler's bodies lay lifeless. They quietly walk through the living room towards the stairs. They hear a thump-thump from upstairs that stops them dead in their tracks. Jason picks up a heavy geode mounted on a metal stand. He shrugs. They push forward up the stairs. As they get to the top of the stairs, they see a red jumpsuited twin cartwheel across the door at the end of the hall. Zora and Jason hesitate before continuing down the hallway past the dead original Tyler twins on the floor. As they reach a corner, a gallop quickly approaches. It's Nix, who runs towards them at an alarming speed. She bears down on Zora with her brass scissors, but Zora whacks her hand, first sending the scissors skidding across the floor. Zora hits her again, sending her awkwardly careening over the edge of the mezzanine and crashing through the coffee table below. They continue past an open closet, where Ayo's legs lower from the handstand in the closet. She pops out lunging at them, but Zora nails her in the head with the fire poker, knocking her down. Zora winds up and finishes her with two more whacks. Done. Their adrenaline spikes from the trauma, but they must move on. We see through Gabe's eyes. Crouched in a small dark cabin, the boat moves as Tex steps onto it. He leans over into the boat. Gabe's face is illuminated red as he shoots a flare gun at Tex. The flare misses, but hits the side of the boat and lands in the boat. The flare illuminates the entire area as Gabe gets the upper hand and bashes Tex. The glow from the flare outside illuminates the entire bedroom. Dahlia rushes to the window with a freshly bloody face. Her eyes widen with excitement and horror. A silent scream that loses itself in its own production and somehow ends with almost a tickled glee. The door behind Dahlia slowly opens. Zora takes a couple of steps towards her and swings, but Dahlia sees her in the reflection of the window and turns, catching the fire poker. She overpowers Zora, who screams as Dahlia falls on top of her. No! Adelaide lunges towards them, but is stopped by the handcuffs. Dahlia raises her scissors over her head, when all of a sudden, Jason stabs her in the back of the neck with the pair he picked up. Gabe gets to the front door. Just before he can grab the knob, the door swings open. It's Zora, covered in blood. She's exhausted and out of it. Gabe relieved. Boats are done. I'm done with boats. She helps her dad in, and they shut the door. The Wilsons occupy the blood-spattered main room. Gabe sits on the phone. Zora and Jason eat from a cereal box. Adelaide, fully handcuffed, watches the window. I can't believe they're dead. Why did they do it? There's no reason. It's all craziness. Gabe puts the phone on speaker. We're sorry, 
Due to an overwhelming amount of calls, all our operators are currently busy. Please hold and an operator will... Gabe turns the speaker off and tosses the phone on the table. How does 911 put you on hold all night long? I don't get it. Zora traumatized to herself. It's too many twins, man. How many of everybody is there going to be? Adelaide looks over to the TV. The rest of the Wilsons follow suit and one by one turn their attention to the TV. Moments later, Jason finds their remote and turns it on. The television clicks on showing live footage of Santa Cruz building with lights from sirens in the distance. The Chiron at the bottom of the screen says, Widespread attack in multiple cities. The crowd was dispersing and we... Oh shit. Don't curse. I can curse because I'm an adult and this is a fucked up situation. Heard this woman say they're coming out of the sewers. And uh, I know some of them had scissors and were just stabbing people. So, so we just started running. Everybody started running the opposite direction. It was chaos. The anchor has a grim shakiness to his voice. Wow, so uh, how many of them were there in this group? I don't know, a lot. There was a lot of them. Oh God, I hear people screaming. Are you safe? I'm sorry, I have to go. We have to get out of here. Ma'am? Ma'am? Okay, so there you hear some harrowing first-hand accounts that paint a picture of deeply disturbing and clearly connected events, which is very much still in progress. If you're just tuning in, there's still so much we don't know, but we can say with some confidence that we appear to be in the midst of one of the most brutal and terrifying, widespread and coordinated attacks this country has ever seen. There is obviously a lot of misinformation out there, so we're being careful what we report, but what is clear is that there are multiple assailants and multiple casualties, and one common thread seems to be the use of scissors and shears to commit these attacks. And they look like us. They don't even know that yet. To our knowledge, no group has taken credit for this attack, and we have new images coming in. To his earpiece. Okay. Okay. We have new images coming in from Chicago. The television cuts to iPhone camera footage of downtown Chicago. A line of people are forming a hand-in-hand -hand human chain down the middle of the street. There are several dead bodies laying nearby. This, uh, this seems to be a group of individuals engaged in some sort of demonstration or protest. It's not clear at this time or how these people are connected with the attack that is taking place, but a new bloody doppelganger goes to join the line. Other tethered come from different directions to add to the line as well. The anchor is stunned and silent for what feels like an eternity. Okay, uh, what is that? That's them. What are they doing? Gabe to himself. I don't know, but that would take a shitload of coordination. The others look at him. Adelaide gets up. We have to go. What? You're joking, right? Zora, help your father. Gabe to the kids. She's tripping. Where are we gonna go? The police, right? No, we need to move and keep moving. We'll take the coast. Go to Mexico. Mexico? Whoa, whoa, whoa. we have everything we need here. Food, water, backup generator. We're as safe as we're going to be anywhere. Tell that to Josh and Kitty. They're right there. She points to Josh and Kitty's corpses. You're scaring the kids. Too late. Too late. I don't know if you realize this, but I'm pretty... I'm pretty messed up. They don't know where we are. It was my idea to come here. She'll have the same idea. Then let's set up some traps. You know, like Home Alone shit. That way, tell me you did not just reference Home Alone. You know what I mean. Gabe, they've been planning this. They have the upper hand. This is the time to run, not to be sprinkling micro-machines on the floor. What are micro-machines? What's Home Alone? We are staying, and that's final. You don't get to make the decisions for us anymore. Gabe has no retort, but still doesn't like it. Does this mean we get their car? Gabe hadn't yet considered this tiny bright side. Zora and Jason help Gabe limp out to the driveway. Adelaide leaves last. The car keys! Mom! Adelaide barely stops the door from shutting. Adelaide opens the door and ruffles through the bowl on the table near the front door. No keys. Adelaide gives the place a quick scan 
and almost enters when she stops cold. Nyx is no longer in the wreckage of the broken coffee table. Adelaide, in terror, begins to back out of the house when she sees the car keys. They are on the kitchen counter, all the way across the house on the other side of a large kitchen island. Adelaide curses herself for what she's going to do. Mom, what? Adelaide takes off into the house. Adelaide hauls ass through the living room and into. Adelaide circles the island and grabs the keys. She turns back to see a bloodied Nyx jump on top of the kitchen island like a feral raccoon. She hops towards Adelaide, who grabs a frying pan and swats the living shit out of her, sending the girl to the ground on the other side of the island. Adelaide trips over Josh's body into the kitchen. She backs up into the kitchen as Nyx scurries around the other way around the island towards her, pounces, and then starts choking her. Adelaide reaches for the pair of scissors on the ground nearby. Jason bursts through the front door and runs across the living room. Jason gets to the kitchen just as Adelaide stands and pulls the scissors from Nyx's head. She holds up the car key and hits the unlock button. The car lights beep on. Gabe and Zora turn. Adelaide grabs Jason's hand and runs. In slow motion, Adelaide and Jason emerge from the house. They get to the car where Zora is in the driver's seat. I'm driving. No way. I told her no. Dad's leg is jacked. You're handcuffed. It's not safe. I'm driving. Zora, no. I've got the highest kill count in the whole family. I'm driving. You don't have the highest kill count. I killed both twins. Wrong. I just killed the second one. I killed Kitty. Gabe points around and lands on himself. So that's one, 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 and two. I killed two. I killed myself and Josh. It doesn't matter. Zora, get out. Look! Umbre has arrived. She stands 30 feet ahead of the car, lit up by the headlights. Adelaide quickly gets in the back seat of the car. The family is silent as Umbre stands there. They lock their doors. Press the ignition. Zora does. Okay, so you're going to want to back up and buckle up. Zora throws the car into gear and floors it straight towards Umbre. The car speeds at Umbre, who runs at the car. When the two meet, Umbre crawls up the hood with startling agility. Adelaide, Jason, and Gabe look up to see her fall behind, but she does not. Where is she? Did I get her? They slowly look up. Gabe opens the upholstered cover for the sunroof. Nothing. Then, with a clink, Umbre comes down on the sunroof with her scissors, which break an inch through the tinted glass. Oh, she's there! She's there! Zora stops the car. Umbre, holding onto the scissors firmly stuck in the sunroof, swings to the windshield as the car stops. She pulls the scissors out, and now, face to face with Zora through the glass, stabs at the windshield, which splinters a little. Okay, now... Zora hits the gas again, and the family reels back as the car takes off again. Umbre stabs again. Zora! Okay, be careful. Umbre stabs the windshield again, splintering it further. The car speeds faster. You're going too fast. Umbre raises one arm for another stab. Zora hits the windshield wipers, which hits Umbre's other arm, knocking it away. Before she can attack again, Zora hits the brakes, and Umbre flies into the woods at a turn in the road. Zora stares in shock. Okay, okay, baby, good job. After a beat. You will want to get in the habit of signaling. They look at Gabe. Adelaide grabs the fire poker and gets out of the car. Where's she going? Hey, uh, Addie. Adelaide looks into the clearing. She finds herself face to face with Umbre's face upside down. Her body disappears into the tree. She stops herself before getting within arm's distance. Umbre's back is twisted and broken, but she's still alive. The image hits Adelaide harder than she'd expected. She kneels. Umbre reaches for her enraged. Shh. Umbre's breath slows. She dies. Honk, honk. Adelaide goes to Zora's door. You okay? Zora nods and starts to break down. Okay, now get in the back. Zora slides out the front seat and gets in the back. The Wilsons drive in silence on the empty road. They sit in shock. The trauma has left them almost numb. The scene looks like the aftermath of a very bad day at Disneyland. The town seems absent of people. The Wilsons drive the Tyler's car past a parked car in which all inhabitants are dead. Jason in the back seat, 
tries his magic trick. He snaps and eventually a big spark shoots from his fingers. Surprised he did it, he looks around for someone else who saw it. Zora gives a bloody fist bump. Suddenly, Jason gets a weird look on his face and he looks ahead. The car turns a bend to find the old Wilson's car in flames, parked so that it blocks the road. Adelaide stops the car. Whoa, that's our car! It's him. It's the one that looks like me. Suddenly, the left rear tire pops and then hisses as it loses air, followed by the front left tire popping and hissing. Adelaide shifts into reverse. Crippled, the car backs up and Pluto emerges in front of them in the beams of the headlights, holding his scissors as the car makes a sad curve to the left and onto the curb. Shit. Adelaide stops the car. Pluto stands in the road between them and the flaming car. Adelaide grabs the fire poker and steps out. Wait, Mom, no! Stay in the car. Adelaide walks towards Pluto, who steps back away from her. It's okay, you don't have to be afraid, I just want to talk to you. Pluto cocks his head, cautiously intrigued. Gabe, Zora, and Jason watch on. What is she doing? She's talking to him. Adelaide gets closer. Nobody's going to hurt you, just put it down. Pluto looks at his weapon, then back to Adelaide. He's confused. He takes a step away from her, then stops. He lifts his mask, revealing the burn marks. It's okay. Adelaide, carefully clutching her fire poker, walks towards Pluto. You don't have to do this. She puts her hand out. He holds his hand out. Adelaide takes another cautious step towards him. He's listening to her. Jason watches. Pluto leans out, looking past Adelaide at the car. He makes eye contact with Jason in the back seat. No, it's a trick. Jason gets out of the car. Jason! Pluto pulls down his mask. He clenches his scissors. Jason steps outside the car, and Pluto matches his physicality. Realizing that Pluto is mirroring him, Jason takes a step backwards. Pluto follows suit. Jason starts walking backwards. Pluto copies him walking into the fire. Gabe crumples out of the car. Adelaide almost instinctively lunges after him. Pluto goes up in flames. Just then, Red, camouflaged by a red truck, grabs Jason and runs. Adelaide turns, but doesn't see Jason. Jason! She runs. Gabe tries to limp towards the darkness where Red took Jason. Zora exits, too, but doesn't make it far before she loses sight of Jason and breaks down. She screams. Adelaide doesn't stop. Addy! Adelaide runs towards the amusement park. Adelaide runs briskly down the empty boardwalk. A few bodies litter the ground. In the near distance, a line of people hold hands, facing away from her. The line extends from the water's edge to past the amusement park and into the distance. One of the men on the line is the man Jason saw earlier. He has the same face as the homeless man who was stabbed in the beginning. Adelaide turns to the Merlin's forest entrance and walks inside of it. Adelaide walks into the dark maze. It's the same as before inside. She retraces her steps from 25 years earlier. She finds her way to the same corridor where the attack occurred. She walks through the dark opening where young Red came from. She finds a wall and pushes the surface and opens it a crack. Then the door swings open. A white rabbit hops out of the open door at Adelaide's feet. Adelaide steps over the rabbit and cautiously into the empty dark space. She's ready to strike. Inside is a maintenance and technical control room. At the end of the control room, there's a wall. She pushes it and it opens like a door, revealing... An escalator room. Adelaide gets on a downward moving escalator. Adelaide stands and waits. She moves down through the darkness. Eventually, she sees a light below. Adelaide exits into a room that looks like a corner of an underground mall. She turns a corner into a tunnel. It feels like a publicly funded underground compound. The only beings who seem to populate it now are rabbits, which hop around freely on the ground. All the doors are open. Adelaide walks cautiously, stepping past and over rabbits down the hallway. Adelaide walks down the hallway. 
She passes the first open door. The cafeteria is empty of people. The rabbit cages are all open and empty. She keeps walking and passes the next door. It's an empty room with rows of tables. Each table has crude sewing equipment, rabbit fur and pelts. It's a tidy and uniform sweatshop style workspace. Adelaide keeps walking. Zora helps Gabe hobble towards the boardwalk. Bodies are scattered. The sun rises. She holds her golf club and Jason's geode. What does it sound like when a paradactyl goes to the bathroom? What? Nothing. The P is silent. The P? There's no P in pterodactyl. Yes, there is. Who's going to clean up all this? Not me. Is it the end of the world? Nah, the world isn't going to end. It's just going to be different. Zora stops and cries. I don't want it to be different. Mom, uh, mo- Mom knows what to do, okay? She said meet her. She knows. He gets choked up, but stuffs it down. Zora continues. They arrive near the boardwalk. An abandoned ambulance is parked in the street. Its rear doors open. Here, uh, we can wait here. They got bandages and stuff. Look! Gabe does. Far ahead of them is a line of people holding each other's bloody hands. The line starts at the shore and disappears through the city. Get in! They hide in the back of the ambulance. They peek out. Another woman adds herself to the stoic, frightening scene. Zora starts to panic. Yeah, that's some scary shit. What are they doing? Looks like some kind of fucked up performance art. Zora looks up at her dad. Like, you gotta be kidding me. Deeper in the underpass, Adelaide arrives at the door of an empty classroom. She stops. The classroom isn't too different from a standard public school classroom. Rows of desks and chairs. Red stands at the front of the class facing the chalkboard. She snips paper carefully with their scissors. Adelaide walks to the center row of the class behind Red. Where is he? How it must have been to grow up with the sky, to feel the sun, the wind, the trees. But your people took it for granted. We are human too, you know. Eyes, teeth, hands, blood. Exactly like you. We move through an empty underpass. And yet, it was humans that built this place. I believe they figured out how to make a copy of the body, but not the soul. The soul remains one, shared by two. They created the tethered so that they could use them to control the ones above, like puppets. Adelaide looks around for Jason, but doesn't see him anywhere. She moves through, walking towards Red's back. She just snips away. But they failed, and they abandoned the tethered. For generations, the tethered continued without direction. They all went mad down here, and then there was us. Flashback to 1986. Russell throws the ball at the bottle toss booth like before. Rain and young Adelaide watch. You remember... We were born special. Wayland, Russell's doppelganger, Eartha, Rain's doppelganger, Young Red, and Tony, the bottle toss attendant's doppelganger, engage in a darker version of the same action. The underpass version is crazy, morbid, worthless, like a mad ritual in an insane asylum. We toggle between both flashbacks, showing their symmetry, until we see the cafeteria where the tethered are eating bunnies. Red continues cutting paper as Adelaide approaches slowly from behind. God brought us together that night. Young Adelaide's attention is drawn by thunder coming from the beach. Young Red is drawn towards the escalator. Young Red turns towards young Adelaide at the threshold of the darkness. She smiles. I never stopped thinking about you, how things could have been. How you could have taken me with you. Young Red stares at the Hand Across America t-shirt, which is ceremoniously hanged inside of a locker. Years after we met, the miracle happened. Teen Adelaide dances. Teen Red dances. That's when I saw God, and he showed me the path. You felt it too. Teen Red finishes her dance. 
the tethered audience surrounds the reaches for Teen Red. The end of our dance, the tethered saw that I was different, that I would deliver them from this misery. I found my faith and began to prepare. It took years to plan. Flashback, 24 hours earlier. Gloves are put on, sandals and red jumpsuits zipped up. Tethered regular clothing is placed on folded beds. It took years to plan. Adult Red looks at the shrine on the wall. Everything had to be perfect. I didn't just need to kill you. I needed to make a statement that the whole world would see. Red holds up what she's been cutting. It's a chain of red construction paper, cut into the shapes of four people holding hands. The sudden motion stops Adelaide in her tracks. It's our time. Our time up there. Red continues cutting until there are only two paper figures left. Red toward, turns towards Adelaide. And to think, if it weren't for you, I never would have danced at all. Adelaide continues down the center aisle, between the chairs towards Red. The two begin to circle one another. Fourteen-year-old Adelaide steps on stage to begin her ballet recital in front of a rapt audience. It's classic and beautiful. Fourteen-year-old Red stands in one of the rooms of the underpass, in front of an audience of shadowy people observing. She steps out and begins her dance down the line. Her movements are primal, visceral, and dark. Present day. The two fight. Adelaide rushes towards Red with the fire poker overhead. Red parries her with her scissors and pokes Adelaide in the shoulder and walks away, circling Adelaide around the perimeter of the classroom. Adelaide starts pursuing her. Flashback, ballet night. Fourteen-year-old Adelaide's ballet is elegant and beautiful. She dances with a partner that's not there. Fourteen-year-old Red turns heads as she dances. She portrays a girl lost and frightening in a maze. Adelaide runs at Red on the other side of the room. Red kicks a desk, dislodging an entire row of desks towards Adelaide. Adelaide changes direction accordingly and swings at Red. Red dodges and pokes Adelaide in her side. Again, she walks away quickly, rounding some desks to reposition herself on the other side of the room. Fourteen-year-old Adelaide's dance continues, picking up steam. Fourteen-year-old Red dances in fear. She clutches her neck and convulses in pain. Adelaide, hurt, rises. She starts towards Red diagonally crossing the room. She pushes the desk out of her way this time, clearing a sloppy patch. She swings at Red, who dodges. The fire poker sticks in the wall. Adelaide can't immediately dislodge it. Red attacks with open scissors. Adelaide takes her hands off the poker and blocks the scissors with the handcuff chain. Red kicks Adelaide, who flies over some desks. Red runs out the door. Fourteen-year-old Adelaide starts to run with her dance. 14-year-old Red starts to run with her dance. The chase explodes into the main tunnel. Red backs up as Adelaide pursues her. They manage to avoid stepping on the rabbits. 14-year-old Adelaide spins perfectly. 14-year-old Red portrays a body being dragged through the tunnel. Adelaide chases Red around a corner. A new hallway extends in front and behind her. 14-year-old Adelaide delicately caresses her arms while standing on point. Fourteen-year-old Red reaches to the ceiling with heartbroken longing. Adelaide pins Red against the door, her fire poker up against Red's scissors. Adelaide smiles as she pushes. Then Red quickly separates the two sides of the scissors and pokes Adelaide in the side with one of the blades, sending her reeling back. Red slips through the door into rows of bunks that line the empty red-tiled sleeping quarters. It's dark. Adelaide charges in. Red is nowhere to be seen. Adelaide stalks through the bunks. The music crescendos. Red emerges from the shadows behind one bunk with a huge sneak attack. Adelaide turns just in time. Both young Red and young Adelaide prepare for the huge finale. As the music peaks, 16-year-old Adelaide runs and leaps, landing perfectly with no partner. 14-year-old Red's sorrow turns to rage as she runs and leaps, but falls to the hard floor. 
Red has been run through by the fire poker. She falls to the floor. Adelaide stands over her. Adelaide picks up and places Red's limp body on the bed and sits next to it. She begins to whisper, the itsy bitsy spider. Adelaide pushes the chain from her handcuffs onto Red's neck, choking her. Adelaide weeps, but her weeping turns into laughter. Red struggles and dies. Her face goes soft in the end. A noise takes her out of it. She turns sharply. She walks over to an industrial locker slash closet with ventilation slats in it. She opens it. Jason stands inside, trembling, his eyes and mouth wide open in shock. Adelaide hugs him hard and weeps happily. There you are, my love. I found you. He is frozen in fear. Look! She starts wiping his tears, but smears blood across his cheek. They're all gone now, okay? They can't hurt you, you understand, Jason? Do you? Everything is going to be like it was before. She starts to shake him and realize he's afraid of her. She stops and an awful expression comes over her face. He heard. She keeps wiping his cheek obsessively, but just smears more and more blood. It's going to be like before and... You'll never have to leave me, I promise. Never, ever, ever, ever. Gabe and Zora hide inside the ambulance. Zora goes to the back window and opens the door. They turn to see Adelaide arrive, with Jason in tow. The ambulance drives. We see each person's traumatized face. Jason watches his mother. Flashback. What? She wasn't in Nam. She got lost for 15 minutes. That can be very scary. We don't know what happened to her. Young Adelaide listens to her parents talk to the psychiatrist. So, how do we get her to talk? The mini home ballet studio. Young Adelaide practices methodically in front of the mirror. I think we need to encourage her to draw, write, dance, anything to help us tell her story, but we have to be patient. We are inside the Vision Quest portal, looking out at the beach and ocean. Young Adelaide, the real one, stands by the water. Lightning bursts in the distance over the ocean. Then, beckoned by the mysterious portal, she walks towards us. It's the same shot we saw earlier, but now we also see the reverse. Young Red stands hiding half behind a mirrored wall inside. She's wickedly entranced by the sight of approaching young Adelaide. She backs up into the darkness. Young Red drags young Adelaide as a few people mill around, there are no rabbits on the ground. Young Red stands by the bed with young Adelaide unconscious in it. She leaves. Young Adelaide tries to get up, but finds her hands tethered to the bed frame by a pair of custom-made brass handcuffs. Young Red, now just Adelaide, is gone. She's alone. She struggles and starts to cry when other figures arrive back from dinner. They move slowly and are obscured with shadows. Eartha and Wayland, the other versions of Adelaide's parents, approach her silently. They stand over the bed. Her voice is rough from having been choked. Mom, Dad, I, I want to go home. Eartha and Wayland look at each other. They don't understand her words. Young Adelaide realizes they are not her parents. Eartha pets her on the head. Rain drives Russell and young Adelaide away from the boardwalk. The rain has picked up. Rain and Russell argue, but young Adelaide in the back focuses on a faraway thought. Slowly, she begins to smile. This is not young Adelaide. It's the other little girl from below. We see a bird's eye view following the ambulance driving inland towards the country before we diverge towards the open terrain. As we continue through the sky, we find the row of people standing hand in hand. We follow it. The line goes on and on towards the rising sun. Thank you for listening to the screenplay or movie script for Us by Jordan Peele.